composition. The arrangement of the elements of art according to the principles of design in order to create an overall pleasing structure for a work of art. Um, what you're trying to do is juggle all of the elements uh, to, you know, to create this pleasing experience for your viewer. Uh, you know, ultimately, you know, it's all about relationships and your knowledge of the components and elements and principles of design uh, are going to, you know, inform the decisions that you make. You're, um, you're trying to create something that will resonate with your viewer, right? And um, yeah, it's going to take time, you know, uh, to understand these different elements and how to uh, put them all together in this way that uh, resonates with your viewer, right? Uh, it, you know, it, it's going to take um, study uh, and uh, trial and error, uh, just like practice uh, to get it right. But once you do get there, there's nothing uh, more fantastic than that feeling of creating something that um, will stand the test of time, that you'll feel like you've really contributed something to this world, right? Uh, so uh, we're going to take a look at a series of old masters paintings and see if we can't learn something from the way that they structured their compositions uh, and grow in our knowledge as a result. So let's see here. All right, first up is Mr. and Mrs. Andrews by Gainsborough. You know, this is not my favorite painting in the world. Uh, you know, these don't look like the most pleasant people in the world to hang out with. But I've, over the years, come to kind of begrudgingly respect the way that Gainsborough went about composing this thing. Uh, so um, let's start with, with balance. If I were to talk to you about, you know, the balance of this piece, um, you know, we could talk about, okay, is it symmetrical? No, it's not symmetrical. It's not even on both sides. Um, it's asymmetrical, right? Uh, it's, um, you know, uh, more loosely uh, composed. It's not as formal uh, in its construction. So, um, if we were to go a little further into balance, you know, if you were to make the argument that this doesn't look balanced, what would you say? You know, it, it looks like the focal point is on the left-hand side, and it's so dominant that the right-hand side of the composition seems to pale in comparison. Um, well, yeah, you know, there's more stuff happening on the left-hand side, um, but I would argue that there's enough going on on the right-hand side to balance that out. Uh, so um, let's, let's take a look at that. You know, um, obviously, the left-hand side, we've got two figures and a dog and this big tree. Um, lots going on. But what is happening on the right-hand side? Is there a particular element that stands out? Well, I would say that the first thing that pops out at me is line, his use of line. Uh, if we were to... Uh, you know, take a look at all of these lines back here, right? There's lots going on. There's um, so much activity there that, you know, it's kind of, you know, you might think it's a little quiet at first, but it, the more you look at it, you really see that there's a lot of activity there that maybe you kind of overlooked. Uh, you know, we can, we can talk also about Kind of harmonizing elements that help counterbalance what's going on on the left. Um, you know, take a look at the clouds in the sky. Is there anything on the left-hand side of the composition that uh, that reminds you of? You know, her dress is arguably the most colorful thing in the entire composition. 
Uh, and we've got these clouds on the right hand side in a similar color that kind of echo that. So there is this kind of counterbalancing that goes on. Uh, you know, um, you know, ultimately, if we take a look at um, the composition and, and we notice this tree on the right hand side, it has a really strong balancing element. Uh, if we, you know, for instance, if we uh, examine this kind of in terms of a steel yard, you know, that's, you know, how they would measure things in the old days. Yes, we've got this heavy weight on the left hand side, but oftentimes in pictorial design, uh, smaller things that are kind of separate can attract a lot of attention. Uh, oftentimes something that's smaller, that's kind of set off in the distance can have as much weight as something in the foreground. And that's what's happening here. Uh, all of those lines on the right hand side and those trees in particular, which serve a double function. Like not only are these trees um, here to, um, you know, counterbalance the weight of the figures on the right, like in the kind of vertical way that they do, but they are uh, there to keep your eye from exiting the composition, right? Like all these lines, uh, will also lead your eye right out the edge of the picture plane if you let it. But uh, Gainsborough, again, uses these trees to block your eye from leaving the composition. Pretty smart. Um, again, the lines also uh, offer perspective and depth, right? We have all these, uh, sorry, these perspective lines here right? Leading our eye, suggesting depth. And then we have all these uh, overlapping lines, sorry, right? This strata of lines back here going off into the distance. That's another way that this balances out. If you look on the left-hand side at the figures, they're right up there in the foreground. And so there's not a lot of deep space on the left-hand side. But on the right-hand side, we have all that deep atmospheric space, all that, all those perspective lines and overlapping lines that suggest depth. And so that attracts our attention as well. Uh, I think you can start to see, like, there's more to this than you maybe first thought. Uh, there's a lot going on on the right-hand side that counterbalances what's going on on the left. Um, now, just because, you know, uh, in terms of subject matter, what's on the right might not be as attractive to your eyes as what's on the left. doesn't mean that there's not a lot going on physically to still counterbalance and attract the eye. Okay, so um, let's turn our attention to um, the subject, right? The, um, the two figures on the left with their dog, the guy with his gun and his pointy hat, um, the woman seated with her big dress. Uh, there's no doubt what the, the, what the focal point is, right? But, um, you know, how is it that Gainsborough makes them the focal point? Well, the way that you create dominance, and therefore focus in a composition, is through contrast, typically. Um, contrasting color, value, size right? Uh, textures, you know, whatever it is, if you create contrast there, you know, that area is going to stand out. And so if we look at uh, Mrs. Andrews, I mentioned that big blue dress, it's like a catcher's mitt for your eyes. <laughs> it, it's, you know, arguably the largest shape. It's the most intense color. Um, and if we look at Mr. Andrews, um, like huge value contrast, black next to white, right? And in fact, if we look at that tree behind Mrs. Andrews, that really dark sh sh tree in shadow, and then she's so bright right in front of it. Value contrast, color contrast, contrasting shapes, uh, contrasting surfaces. You know, he's definitely using the elements uh, and principles to really make them stand out. 
Uh, and you need to do the same thing in your compositions. Like think contrast, think variety. That's what will get things to stand out. What is your most important uh, element in the design? And uh, create contrast to get people to, to look at it and pay attention to it. Okay, so let's talk about compositional shaping for a minute here. Because I think it's really important that you consider uh, the shapes that you organize your elements in uh, as you're um, you know, creating your composition. And if, if we look at Mr. and Mrs. Andrews, uh, what shape are they? All right. Uh, they're a big triangle, right? Uh, it's a pyramid shape. And you're going to see this a lot, especially in old master's work. There are many different shapes that you can use, but you'll see a lot of triangular pyramid shapes uh, in old master's work. Because it, it just works. It's, it's a solid shape. It's an interesting shape. Uh, so I guess, you know, one way to uh, consider organizing, structuring your composition. But if we look also, like, there's, there's also this, L shape working through this composition. And I've already mentioned the, the strata of lines on the right hand side and how important that is. Each one of these things is a way of structuring the composition. You need to have the same game plan when you're putting your pieces together. Don't just leave it to chance. Think about how am I going to organize this? You could have a whole group of like uh, dissimilar elements in your piece. Uh, subject matter that's all over the place, but if you structure it, it will hold together and attract attention. Okay, so uh, you know if we if we look at that group, um, we start to see okay, well within that pyramid of figures, there's like one part of it that stands out maybe a little bit more. And uh, I think Gainsborough really wanted to highlight Mrs. Andrews. He's got that dark tree that frames her. She's got this huge dress that delivers our eye right to her. All of those lines on the right-hand side, if you think about it, all these lines over here, pick up and deliver our eye to the bench, which delivers us to her, right? All those lines converge and essentially, you know, essentially they deliver our eye to her. Uh, so um, if you stop and think about it within that triangular group of figures, which is our focal point, she is kind of the super focal point, right? And Let's think for a moment about where she's placed, because placement is very important in composition. Where is she at? Well, she's at one-third in this compositional structure, right? Uh, if you divide the canvas up into thirds, right? One, two, three across the top, one, two, three down the side, and draw lines to divide it up into thirds, the focal point according to the rule of thirds, should fall at one of those intersecting um, lines. So, I'll share the steel yard again about balance, but uh, here is uh, that rule of thirds in action, right? And look where she's at. Her head is pretty much right at one-third in the composition. Um, so, you've heard of this rule of thirds before, right? Or maybe you haven't. Um, again, that compositional guide that suggests that the focal point should fall at the intersection of these lines at one-third in the composition. Well, why does that work? You know, a, a lot of times we just do it naturally. And then there are other times when we're not thinking straight, when we put the focal point right in the dead center of the composition. Usually not a good idea because it traps your attention there. It's like a bullseye target. Uh, I've heard it described as a mop, middle-of-page design, which is usually not a good thing. 
Likewise, you usually shouldn't put your focal point trapped in one of the corners either. You usually want to get it away from the corner and get it out of the center of the composition. It doesn't mean that you don't have things in the corner or running through the center of the composition. It just means that your major focal point probably should not be there. Okay, so back to the rule of thirds. Um, why is it a rule? Um, well, a long time ago, uh, the ancient Greeks discovered this particular thing called um, the golden mean, right? This seemingly perfect ratio of 1 to 1.618, and a bunch of other numbers too. Uh, but 1.618 uh, is known as phi, and um, that, uh, not pi, but phi, and that is just the most um, beautiful harmonious relationship of, of one number to the other, right? And if you look closely uh, at, you know, 1 to 1.618, it creates a line on a rectangle that's pretty close to one-third, right? Uh, and so that's essentially where that rule of thirds comes from, is that number, that ratio, 1 to 1.618. And so you might be thinking, well, you know, that's just kind of a random number that the Greeks picked out, um, uh, and they just decided that was the most beautiful rela relationship, but uh, it's deeper than that. Uh, so, yes, in ancient Greek architecture and sculpture, that relationship of 1 to 1 1.618 is everywhere. It really did govern um, what they did, and they were magnificent artists and architects. Um, so, um, if we um, want to discover why it's so beautiful and so perfect, the real origins, uh, that comes a little bit later uh, with this fellow named Fibonacci. You might have heard of him, maybe not, but Fibonacci discovered, and Fibonacci was like a businessman. Uh, he kind of happened upon, accidentally, uh, kind of the origins of why uh, the rule of thirds works and why 1 to 1.618 is so beautifully structured. Uh, by observing nature, and this is what we should all should be doing as artists, is observing nature and making sure that we're paying attention because it has so much to teach us, right? Nature is your real teacher, not me. <laughs> you know, I'm a poor substitute. If you're observant of nature, you're going to learn so much and be such a great artist. Well, uh, Fibonacci was observing nature. He um, basically was thinking about rabbits and uh, if, if we were to put two rabbits in a field and let nature take its course, you know, they would produce another pair of rabbits. And so he put it in front of himself, this problem of how many rabbits would be, you know, how would they reproduce and, and how many pairs of rabbits could he come up with? Well, uh, as he did the accounting, uh, basically he, you know, like the first month, one pair. The second month, still just one pair because it takes them a month to mature to the point where they can reproduce. Third month, there are two pairs, right? Uh, you know, and so uh, this sequence of numbers of these bunnies reproducing emerged, and Vibonacci really didn't know what he had on his hands. It wasn't until later that people really examined what he had dis discovered with this sequence of numbers and were amazed. Um, so from bunnies and their reproductive uh, habits, we get the Fibonacci sequence. Have you heard of it? Look it up, it's pretty important. So this is the sequence. 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13, 21, etc. So do you see the pattern? How does it, you know, evolve? Well, the previous two numbers in the series are added together to get the next number. 
right? So 1 plus 1 is 2, 1 plus 2 is 3, 2 and 3 is 5, right? Etc., etc. Right? 13 and 21 is 34, 21 and 34 is 55. All right, so the previous two added together, you get the next one. The Fibonacci sequence is connected to the golden ratio. Did you know that? Well, if you divide the Fibonacci series, and like one number into the other, the, the higher you go in the sequence, the more it, it returns results that are closer to 1.618, right? All right, so the Fibonacci sequence, this, this sequence of numbers that comes to us from nature is essentially validating phi, right? 1.618. Um, pretty fascinating. And I don't like, you're, you're artists and I'm making you think about math. And, you know, I'm not a mathematician, but there's a certain beauty to numbers. Um, you know, and mathematics certainly uh, permeates the universe. And um, when you get numbers to back up what you do, it, you know, it feels solid, right? Uh, so more Fibonacci numbers in nature. Did you know that honeybee family trees governed by the Fibonacci sequence? The number of petals on flowers are like usually Fibonacci numbers, right? Spirals, right? Um, check this out. When those Fibonacci numbers are arranged in a rotating sequence of corresponding sized squares, look what happens. All right, here we go. One, one, two, three, five, eight, thirteen. All right, if you just take squares of corresponding sizes uh, and arrange them so that they fit like a puzzle, the result is a logarithmic spiral. Pretty cool, huh? You ever seen that in nature? They're everywhere. Right, a nautilus shell cut in half, that's a logarithmic spiral derived from those Fibonacci numbers. If you look closely at the seeds in uh, certain flowers, sunflowers in particular, you know, you get spiral after spiral after spiral coming out from it. Again, governed by the Fibonacci sequence. Uh, pine cones, if you look at the bottom of a pine cone. Next time you see a pine cone, pick it up and look for the spirals that emanate from the center. Okay. If we look at water, if we look at hurricanes, right? <laughs> we got Fibonacci numbers at work. The human body, right? From DNA double helix that spirals uh, to things like ears and hands, etc. Uh, all right. Fibonacci sequence at work in nature, in us. The universe itself has. These structural elements, these numbers at work, permeate the universe, right? You know, the rule of thirds isn't just, uh, you know, some arbitrary number that we came up with. The universe itself is crying out to you <laughs> to have a focal point and place it at one third in your composition. Right, to think about these relationships, uh, the arrangement of these elements in this way will put your work in tune with the universe. And that's no small thing. Like, uh, so many artists think that what they do is not important, right? They've been told that it's not important, but I'm here to tell you that 
what you do as an artist, as a designer, is the most important job there is. When you design things and compose things in this way, when you're thinking about you know, nature and the universe, your work takes on qualities that transcend time, that transcend space. Like you are putting your self and your work in accord with the universe, right? It's an amazing feeling, but you have to stop and think about it. You have to kind of put your thoughts on that level from time to time and remind yourself that what you do is so important, right? Remember, we are the makers of meaning as artists, as designers. It's our job to teach the world uh, how to form relationships, how to communicate with one another, how to put themselves in accord with nature and the universe. Uh, okay, so anyway, um, you know, we can look at uh, the Fibonacci numbers, the rule of thirds, it applies to photography, to web pages, to logos, not just paintings, right? Everybody uses it. So back to Mr. and Mrs. Andrews. Is this a well-balanced piece? Yes. Uh, it is um, constructed in a very careful way, uh, but not in a forced way. It is beautiful, right? If for no other reason, it's structured in such an amazing way. And here, you know, Gainsborough is really thinking about his focal point. He's placed Mrs. Andrews right there. He's structured the whole canvas in such a way that's very pleasing. Uh, this doesn't happen by accident, right? Uh, he, you know, he really had to think this out and, and get it planned just right. And you need to practice this yourself. Like, don't just let your compositions fall wherever they will, right? You have to stop. Think about it. How are you going to organize it? How are you going to structure it? Um, you know, that energy that you put into the piece, uh, the sense of motion, uh, the way that you attract our attention to your focus, the way that you bring the other parts of the composition uh, into harmony with it to deliver our eye to that focal point. Um, there's so much involved. Um, and again, with study and practice and perseverance, you're going to get there and you're going to make wonderful, beautiful things that people um, uh, are going to be attracted to. You're going to create things that will resonate with others. And um, hopefully, um, you know, you'll have a lifetime of joy from making things that are meaningful and beautiful. Okay. All right. So <laughs> that's part one. Uh, uh, you know, uh, in the next part, we're going to take a look at a, a few more examples uh, and see uh, about how um, other artists structure their compositions uh, and dig a little deeper. Okay, so um, that's part one. Um, um, part two will continue the, the discussion.